Jad Salemi, hi. Hi, Jihad. Jad, you're the co-founder and managing partner of Phoenician Funds, uh, one of our uh, newest funds in, in Lebanon? One of the newest, uh, yes. Before we start on Phoenician, tell me more about yourself. So I am, uh, as you said, I am Jad Salemi. I'm managing partner of uh, Phoenician Funds, a venture capital firm uh, based in, here in Beirut. Um, before that, I uh, used to work in consulting uh, with McKinsey in Dubai, uh, focusing on financial services. Uh, and I graduated actually from uh, ESA uh, and uh, with a double diploma from OSCP as well in mass in ma as a master's in management uh, and from AUB and a bachelor's in uh, business administration. Um, I've worked also in London in banking, uh, in investment banking with JP Morgan. Um, and uh, we launched actually the fund in, 2000, uh, in December 2015. What got you to the fund? What tempted you? I mean, you could have stayed and, 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 and make a lot of money in consulting. What, what really tempted you to, to go create a fund? Uh, first, uh, you know, I, I've always wanted to, uh, to do something entrepreneurial. Uh, so I spent almost 10 years uh, working uh, in uh, big companies. Uh, and I always had this uh, passion to go and uh, set up something for my own. <coughs> so uh, in 2015, as you know, the Circular 331 uh, had already been issued uh, and uh, there was clearly an opportunity to uh, come back to Beirut and to set up something and uh, get the support and leverage all the ecosystem that the 331 uh, wa uh, was uh, about to create and was creating at the time. So uh, I was, if you want, passionate and crazy enough uh, to leave a very stable consulting job uh, and come, ba come back here and set up the fund. Uh, and actually, the Phoenician Fund One, so it's our first uh, fund, is um, is backed by the uh, 331 circular. So uh, it is uh, actually, I mean, everyone, I know. I'm, no, I'm asking you this because a lot of, of times, and we can discuss this later, but a lot of <coughs> time we tend to forget that people who create funds are, in a way, entrepreneurs themselves. Uh, you're creating a company yes, in, in itself. Yes. It's a financial company, but you're still creating a company. Uh, t tell me more about, about Phoenician. So Phoenician, uh, the idea came uh, in 2013. Uh, we, uh, at the time, uh, we were a team of uh, five people working together very closely. And we had this idea of uh, setting up an investment vehicle that invests in technology. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we started shaping this idea uh, together uh, and we started also uh, connecting and collaborating uh, with Banque du Liban on how potentially we could help since there was a program here and since we were all very, uh, very, you know, in a way attached to our country and we wanted to contribute to the, uh, to the development of this ecosystem. Uh, we decided that it would be also a good, uh, a good idea to go and start co-shaping this with the central bank. And this is what we did. So we started the talks. Uh, and at the time, clearly, there was, uh, uh, if you want, two gaps that we've identified. Uh, and that resonated quite well with, uh, with the central bank and with the other stakeholders, uh, including uh, our existing uh, limited partners, the banks, the commercial banks in Lebanon and the financial institutions. One, there was a, a gap in the early stage investment, including seed. Uh, and this is what we are among the first funds that codified in our investment strategy the seed level uh, investments. So what's the upper ticket limit? So we go from uh, 200K up to $1 million. Okay. Uh, and when we say $1 million, that includes the follow on. So we usually okay. tranche our investments and we tranche them based on milestones and KPIs. Uh, and this is, of course, this can change with time once you invest in the company, but usually this is what uh, our, this is our investment approach. So there was a, clearly a gap in the, in the early stage. Uh, and, we, uh, and we thought, given our expertise and given our uh, advisory experience and uh, our experience in specific uh, uh, sectors, which we can talk about later on, we decided that it would be uh, this combination of our capabilities and filling in the gap at the seed level uh, could be very attractive for the ecosystem in general and for the potential investors. And this is what we did. Um, so we set up Phoenician Fund 1. We focus on seed stage investments. And also we uh, thought 
we thought about what are the sectors that are missing in the ecosystem or that uh, lacked focus in terms of institutional investment, of which uh, f financial technology was one, uh, education uh, technology was two, ad tech, uh, healthcare, uh, e-government, and we uh, left uh, around 30, 20 to 30 percent of the uh, fund size to be allocated opportunistically uh, to uh, other uh, investments in other sectors, other stages, uh, and we usually do that on a co-investment basis. All right. So what does Phoenician bring in addition to the money? I'm an invest I'm in a startup. I go to see you. What do you bring more than just the money? So, you know, this is a very good question because when you go and raise funding, uh, you also have to be uh, very careful on who your partners are uh, because these partners, spe spe especially at the early stage, will be sitting on your board, uh, will have certain uh, rights uh, and, and minority rights that will be part of the, of the deal structure. Uh, so it is also from an entrepreneur perspective, this is a very good question to ask. You know, what other than capital, what can this fund bring me? Uh, and here uh, we, and this is part of our investment criteria. So when we think about an investment, we definitely think, okay, what problem does it solve? How differentiated it is, scalable, the market, potential market size, etc., the team, etc. But also, we look at how we can add value to the company. And a lot of times we go, we have uh, very attractive investments where we feel maybe we cannot add that much in value. We either co-invest with someone who can, or we, or we kind of uh, reevaluate uh, the deals. Uh, so what we bring is basically on specific sectors, we bring a very deep expertise uh, in those sectors. Uh, example, fi financial technology. So this is a sector that we know very well in the region, globally. Uh, uh, we know the regulations, we know the compliance that, that comes it requires. from your experience yes. in the consultancy. Yes, this comes from our experience. So all your partners are, are in Phoenician are previous Most consultants? of them, yeah, most, most of them. them. Right. Uh, and we have entrepreneurs, we have investors, we, have, uh, we, have, we are a combination of uh, okay. advisors, entrepreneurs yeah, and tool, investors. Tool. Yes. So we have that, uh, we provide access uh, to key market players, uh, we provide uh, throughout the investment life cycle support on strategy operations, recruitment, attracting talent through our network. Uh, we, so we kind of also provide potential access to financial sponsors or, 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 or companies you know, for exit as th well. Th that's interesting, I mean, it, it brings me to, 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 I think, a question that many people sometimes wonder, especially entrepreneurs, when they go and knock on the door of, of a VC. You know, take me through a typical day of a VC. What, how, what's, what's a day in, in Jad Salim's life? What you know, do you do? In VCs... You uh, just say no to startups? Th there is no typical day. <laughs> it's always, it's very sporadic. So, so sometimes you have, um, you know, it really depends on, on the deal flow that you're getting. It really depends on, you know, it's also a bit cyclical. So you don't always on, on religiously every day get 10, uh, 10 companies. Uh, but typically we work on, uh, uh, on deal sourcing. So this is a big chunk of our uh, work. Uh, deal sourcing uh, either through our proprietary network or deals that come uh, uh, on direct solicitation. Uh, we also have our partners, our incubators, accelerators that send us uh, deals, etc. So this is, you know, a big chunk of uh, what we do is basically selecting uh, uh, and pre run a preliminary selection on what are the deals that could be attractive for us uh, given our investment strategy. And we discuss those every day with the team. We have uh, internal meetings and with the, with the partners in the fund. Uh, then we also, uh, for the ones that are selected, uh, we go through... Uh, what we call uh, a preliminary assessment. Uh, and this is where we prepare a, a very high level memorandum that we share with our investment committee to get their feedback. And after that, uh, we go and, and all of these run in parallel. So it's not like it's, yeah, exactly. it's one step You're after the other. Uh, and after that, you have due diligences that you need to conduct for the investments that, the, and that the, your IC and the, our IC and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and the fund has selected. Etc. You need to go and we execute deals, we do structuring, we help, we monitor the portfolio, which is also a big chunk of our day. And if you see, since we started, so the, uh, the, the percentage of time we used to spend on the investment side was much larger than what we used to spend on monitoring because we were, st we were still investing the money. But today you see the, the, the balance uh, tilting more towards monitoring, which is by itself a very different discipline. So you need to really uh, follow up, see how you can support the startups, uh, see how you can 
uh, help them in creating value in, in, in potentially going to the next round or some, sometimes take I'm, the hard I'm decision. I'm going to get back to, to, to this, especially to the due diligence, because I think there's a lot of misconception on what the due diligence <laughs> is and, and, and should be. Uh, but in, in, in the midst of that, of that very heavy day and, and, and tasks, and you meet a lot of people, by the way. So you meet entrepreneurs, you respond for the ones negative, it's a positive, job. et cetera. So how it's, to it's catch... It's a very iterative process. How do I... How, I'm an entrepreneur. How do I catch Jad Salemi's interest? What's going to catch your interest? So one is, uh, are you solving a problem? An existing, a real problem? Uh, and are you solving it in a differentiated fashion? Uh, and this is something that we, uh, and, it, and the, the problem should not be in isolation of what the market really needs. So a lot of times you see great entrepreneurs, great products, super innovative, tech-wise, etc. Uh, but you, 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 and then you take a step back and you see that this product has been actually shaped in isolation of what, of what the real market needs. So the first, if you want, uh, thing that strikes us is, okay, is there really, do, you feel, do we feel there is really a need for it? Is the market big for this? Is it scalable? This is one very important part. Uh, and if, and, and the, the, the second is, is this company or this founder have a vision? So sometimes you have a lot that uh, confuse features with products, products with what a company is. And this is something that, you know, uh, we really give a, a deep thought on when we meet or when we look at an investment. What are you sending us? A feature, a product, a company, a team? One of our, our guests uh, the other day told us, uh, you know, we're, we're asking, uh, asking him about, you know, what makes him an a successful entrepreneur. He said, I have a clear mission, yes. a clear vision. You know, they know where they're going. Exactly. And this, and it has to be something that, that is real as well, you know. Uh, and uh, and the, the third, which is also very important, is the team itself. Is the team fully committed, passionate about uh, about what they're doing? Is are they crazy enough when you have this you know this very big vi mission but and vision? But is all this enough, Jad? Because a lot of times you go with a great project, you're a great team, you have solved the problem. You go, but the fund tell you, look, you're not going to get me the IRR I want. You're not going to get me the return on investment I'm, I tend to look for because as a VC, I tend to look. What's, what's the typical IRR you look for? Look, a VC will always tell you, uh, and it depends on the stage. It depends on, uh, uh, on the risk return profile of the investment you're going into. So if, uh, just to give you a bit of analogy, uh, if I am a, a, a Series C fund, and I'm investing at a certain valuation and a company has a certain traction, revenue, etc., a full-fledged team, a presence in multiple geographies, the risk profile of that investment is very different than when I go into a seed investment where I might have some of the elements in place. I might not have necessarily a revenue or a traction that is proven, validated, but I might have a good product which I believe can get me to that traction. And then I would require maybe 10, 15, 20x of return. So it really depends on where, which stage I'm, I'm at, what are the valuations I'm going in into that investment, and what will be... The, so this is where the risk appetite of the fund comes in. Then, what's, then define for me, because we hear it a lot. I hear it a lot. I sit every day with entrepreneurs. I hear it a lot about, well, you're not VC material. You know? Shumaneta, you're not VC material. So, look, there are core elements uh, for a VC to be able to uh, usually... Now, sometimes VCs take risks on people. Sometimes VCs take risks on a crazy idea. Uh, there is no fixed rule. Uh, but usually what you look for are three things. Is this a, a product or value proposition solving a problem is the tar is is it do i have some kind of validation on that so validation can range depending on the type of company but uh, it can range that do i have already uh, some traction uh, or can i prove that there is a real need etc um, so this is one thing that that's really important the other thing is is my market big can i scale 
because if I, and scale doesn't mean that always it's volume oriented. It can be also, you know, if you're going B2B, it can be if you crack two or three markets, uh, two or three customers, it will, you, you will be able to scale in terms of, and grow in terms of revenue. Uh, and that also, uh, a fund likes to be a bit uh, reassured that this market exists. And this is where uh, startups can run pilots, for example, or get some kind of valid preliminary validation. You're never going to get to a point where you, everything is there, or else, you know, it's not risk capital anymore, it's not VC. So, so for Jad Salami and for Phoenician, you're not specifically, I mean, if you have all these criteria, you're not going to say no to someone no. who's, who's we, at the IRR is, I don't know, 40%, and you're going to say, look, this is too low for us. So this is where, so usually the IRR and the multiples uh, should be, you know, very aggressive because uh, a VC, you have to think about a VC, they look at the portfolio. It's a portfolio game. It's not a company by company game. That's important for, for entrepreneurs to understand. Of course. Uh, and the VC is basically, uh, you invest in uh, maybe, uh, let's uh, just for the sake of an example, uh, 15 or 20 companies. You know that 10% of these are going to you know, make a 10x or 15x return and they are going to compensate for the losses of, remaining company, of the remaining companies. Maybe 20 or 30% of these will you know, be self-sustainable and become lifestyle businesses. And the others will probably go bankrupt. So this is what a VC basically, uh, a typical profile of a VC looks like in terms of you know, success rate, in terms of, uh, uh, and, and, and when you think about return, uh, this is where you, you this is why you uh, you re you require a higher multiple uh, because you know that you're going to have failures in the portfolio uh, and this is why the vc has has risk appetite to go into companies where you're getting a minority it's very important to note that uh, and to take a step back a vc uh, puts the whole usually capital into the company uh, as a sole funder uh, and gets a minority in that company and the founders keep the majority you typically, uh, uh, which is, you know, if you look at any business, in a business that has no real value, no assets, etc. And I think this, you know, entrepreneurs need to understand that this entails, this, uh, this entails a requirement of a very high return. If you were telling me I am investing in a you know in a stable asset etc., I would do my, my I would do my yeah, valuation you, you differently. You would know what's what. Exactly. No, definitely th there is. I mean, this is it's very interesting because I think a lot of the entrepreneurs don't understand when I sit down with the VC that the VC is looking at it from a portfolio perspective, not just from your startup yes. uh, as, as as one element. And this is due. I mean, there's a big misunderstanding between VCs and 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 and, and, and investors. Uh, maybe not misunderstanding, but different language sometimes yes. that is being spoken. I'm a startup, you know, I'm solving a problem. I have a differentiated uh, way of solving it. Um, I have a vision. You're interested by me, at least, to sit down and talk to me. What advice would you give to these startups? Uh, you know, what advice do you do? You, because you've obviously seen a lot of mistakes that entrepreneurs are doing, even if they have these core elements. Look, I think uh, the, the, the most important thing is you need to be convinced about your story. And if you're convinced about your story and you're passionate about your story, you are going to communicate it in a very compelling manner. And what you see uh, a lot in the, not only in this ecosystem uh, abroad as well, is that you see very well uh, crafted business plans. Uh, and then you go and talk and you want the essentials out of it. You, know, you want the, uh, you know, the, the insights, the key insights. Uh, and you find that you know, there is actually no clear vision. Although you look at the business plan, it is, you know, it is very well uh, polished uh, and very well structured. And I think a lot of times you realize that the first five to ten minutes sitting with an entrepreneur, you get excited or you don't. And, uh, and this is very important. The way, the story, how it is, if, and, and you can feel the, the people when they tell the story, if, they, if they really there is a drive, there is a passion behind it, and there is, uh, you know, something real that's happening. Uh, and this don't is don't be a robot. When you exactly, work. don't be a robot, and don't, you know, it's good to have structure, and this is our job as well, is to help you get structure. Uh, but also, it's important to be convinced of your own, and not be of your own product, of your own proposition, and not be opportunistic. 
Uh, and this is something, you know, that plays a lot. I think, uh, you know, you would probably maybe talk to other VCs, but they would tell you the same thing. The first 10 minutes sitting with an entrepreneur, you already know if, you know, if you're interested, if you want to take it yeah. forward or not. Uh, what, what are habits of, of Lebanese or even Arab entrepreneurs that you, get to, you tend to see habits that you like, don't like? Or habits that you like a lot, maybe? Look, in, in any nascent ecosystem, uh, definitely culture plays a lot. So, uh, you know, in Lebanon, uh, we are, uh, when you're born, you're brought up, uh, you have, uh, you know, they tell you your parents or your, uh, your, your uh, family surroundings expect from you to become a doctor, to become an engineer, to become, you know, uh, uh, these kind of profiles. Parliament member. Parliament member, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> if it's hereditary. Uh, but I think, and this is, you know, this is uh, an entrepreneurship in the way, uh, you know, a VC or a, a startup ecosystem looks at, there is a disconnect between where we were and, 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 and where we should be. Uh, and you see that a lot of people are struggle to, you know, to understand how an investor thinks about their business how an accelerator thinks about their business, how an incubator thinks about their business. Uh, and, um, and this is, uh, and even your own customers and your own users. Uh, and this is something that, you know, it is not a traditional business. It is a business where, you know, you have to be lean, you have to be agile. And this is something that, you know, is, is starting to pick up in the region, but it is something that entrepreneurs struggle, struggle with in the yes. region. Uh, so this is one thing. And also, you have all the, you know, uh, the uh, the rights and the and the legal and the administrative part uh, that is institutional. And you know, in the region, institutional in this uh, in this segment is new. So you see a lot of resistance as well and a lack of understanding. Uh, but you know, this is with time. More and more, you see uh, with uh, uh, the uh, the learning curve becoming, you know, a bit less. Steep and, and, and I mean, because you opened the topic about, I mean, you're hinting at the ecosystem where, where it stands today. Are you overall optimistic on the ecosystem? Uh, yes, I'm very optimistic on the ecosystem, and uh, you can see that you know, when the 331 was launched, there was a lot of momentum above the line. Uh, so you had, you know, big events, you there had a lot of momentum. Uh, but it was all above the line. And if we look at, you know, what was really happening on the ground, it was still limited because, you know, it had it was taking yes. time to set up the uh, VCs, to get all the ecosystem aligned with the vision. Now what you see that a lot of things are happening below the line. So you see a lot of investments are, are happening. A lot of money is being invested. A lot of companies are being created. So we've invested in 11 companies since we started. Uh, we uh, Other funds, other, uh, other new funds are also... Uh, getting, uh, you know, deploying uh, capital and uh, supporting companies, uh, which was the activity is 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 is, is not that uh, is is very, um, if you want, positive in that sense. Uh, uh, but you know, there was there is less momentum around, you know, the, the whole the, exactly the whole media and the but which is you good, see, which, which is good, which is healthy. Which is healthy, and you see a lot of also what is positive is you see a lot of setups that are outside 331 that are being today developed. Uh, so there is a new fund that was launched by uh, the uh, by uh, MIC1 and MIC2. The telecom operators. Exactly, the telecom operators. You see a lot of angel investments, uh, investors, angel networks being set up with a lot of interest. You see also family uh, offices and investment companies. You know a few that are also interested in this ecosystem and investing green money. So you see that at the end of the day, the, it's true that the pieces of the puzzle are a bit you know, disorganized, but with time, I think we're on the right track. We're to, getting there. Yes. Jad, um, I mean, we, we started the, the, this conversation, uh, we were saying how Phoenician Funds is a startup in itself. Um, you've obviously <coughs> made some good decisions and some bad decisions. Of course. Um, can you... Walk us through some of them. Uh, you mean uh, uh, in the, uh, as part of Phoenician funds, the company, our company? As a company or, or your investments? Uh, uh, so look, I think uh, overall the experience was very positive. Uh, definitely, you know, uh, uh, you expect uh, to some failures in the portfolio, which is something that is normal. 
Uh, now we're still, you know, in our early stages of investment, uh, even in our investment period, it's been a year uh, almost since we've uh, completed our final closing. Uh, but I think that uh, we've learned a lot. So uh, mistakes, uh, maybe not yet. I think maybe we will because it's normal that we have it's failures and it's part of the game. But are there things we, which we could have done better? Definitely. Uh, so we uh, even, uh, you know, when we first started, we had a very rigid process in place. Uh, so we had to change it to be uh, more lean uh, and to be quicker in our responses to, uh, to entrepreneurs in our execution. Uh, other things that we could do better uh, is basically everything that is related to legal execution. And this is taking a lot of time. Uh, and I think this is something that we should, you know, we should maybe work to get more standardized documentation upfront. Uh, to because you know in a startup lifetime, uh, three months are equivalent maybe to ten years in, in other companies, so it's uh, uh, it's it's very critical to also uh, try to be uh, f quick uh, in this. And we are learning with the, you know and the the uh, the administrative process in Lebanon, uh, be it legal, uh, financial, etc., is not easy as well. It's not very optimal. If if you were sitting with 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 the prime minister today or with the government, you're sitting with the Council of Ministers. What would you tell them you need to change ASAP? So there are definitely the obvious, you know, the obvious uh, Usual suspects. elements, which is infrastructure, internet, electricity, water, uh, transportation, you know. Uh, I was reading the other day that the trans transportation cost us $1 billion uh, to the economy uh, per year. Uh, and it's a, lot, it's, a, it's a big amount of money due to uh, its uh, an optimal uh, 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 process. Uh, I think these are the obvious ones. Uh, another one is, is also on the legal side. So uh, we have to have a legal framework that supports startups in the sense that if you want to set up a company in Lebanon, it costs you three or four times more on average, if you want to set up in the UK or if you want to set up in Dubai, in the UAE. And I think this is something that is very important. And even the number of steps is much higher than any other country and the time it takes you to set up a company. So I think that this is something uh, that is, you know, if we can have a legal framework that allows us to be uh, quicker and leaner in terms of cost and, uh, and process, what that else? would be. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the second one, which is uh, which uh, which is also very important, uh, is uh, all the legal requirements uh, for a company. I think the I, the uh, and the taxes and the uh, and the financials. So uh, I think what could be very and I think Idal is starting to do that uh, is basically to subsidize part of the tax payments, part of the uh, stamp duties uh, due to the government uh, for companies that are new and that are setting, uh, setting up new uh, entities in Lebanon uh, to encourage... Uh, bankruptcy law? Bankruptcy law is one uh, do, very Do you important. think, because I've, it's something I've heard a lot, that if we get a bankruptcy law, we would get more foreign investment in Lebanon? Probably it will reassure uh, international investors uh, to invest in Lebanon since it is, you know, it is uh, bankruptcy law is one of the core pillars of, of a legal framework, of a commercial legal framework. Uh, and also, you know, tax subsidies for these companies for some period of time is also very important. Uh, so today, every time you raise capital, you pay uh, a, a decent amount on stamp duties, etc which is a burden on the companies. And you know, startups, they live off uh, very limited budgets and they want to create value with very limited uh, money. And these, uh, at the end, put pressure as well. So these are, if you want, commercially, you have bankruptcy, you have what you know of tax incentives, uh, you know, making the process of raising capital easier to encourage, uh, to encourage companies to set up in Lebanon. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's it critical. It is one of the, yes. It's critical. Uh, Jad, one last question, um, just to go back a little bit on, 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 on your role as a VC. Do you, do you really look at the Excel valuation sheets? Uh, Seriously? Look, it is, <laughs> it is a very good question. So usually, uh, you know, the valuation is a big topic. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, usually it's uh, very close to the heart of entrepreneurs because, you know, it's a company that they want to set up, they want to own. 
Uh, the way we value investments is uh, there is no scientific way of valuing a startup investment since they are, uh, especially at the early stage, since there are no assets, there are probably no cash positive cash flows, uh, nor uh, maybe no revenues. Uh, uh, and um, It's all assumptions. It's all assumptions. So the, basically what we do is we have three, if you want, we look at it from the three different perspectives. The first one is we need to keep the founders incentivized. Uh, to continue working in the company and to raise additional funding and not get too diluted. So they need, you need to keep them with skin in the game. So this is one part that we look at. The second is uh, we look at uh, uh, similar transactions in similar stages, uh, similar sectors, similar setups, what were their valuation to be consistent with our portfolio strategy and to be consistent with the market and the uh, rationale of, uh, of evaluation. The third one is we look at that we don't really look at, but we, we kind of just test uh, the valuation or we stress test it through an Excel if you want the CF model. But this is more for us to validate the uh, economics of the business, to validate the potential of the business, uh, to see, you know, to play around, see when potentially we can break even. But this is not necessarily used for valuation because the discount rate will be also irrational. <laughs> So to speak. Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> we, no, it's a, it's a, it's a good, it's a good discipline to have because this is where you can really look at the economics of the business, at the unit economics, the client acquisition, the customer acquisition cost, it's, lifetime. It's a very good exercise very for good the entrepreneur exercise as much for as the entrepreneur and for us to really understand, you know, what the are the, what are the KPIs, what are the milestones, uh, but to anchor it into a scientific valuation is not easy. It's difficult. It's difficult because you have different value, uh, assumptions, as you rightly said, different market share uh, assumptions, etc. And you can play around. You have no uh, basis. I'm talking about, of course, the early stage. If you have a proven business model and you already have traction, you already it's have different. growth, it's, it's different. Jad, uh, next time I would, uh, I'm, I'm going to invite you to talk about fintech because I think there are lots it's, it's of things to pleasure. talk about in, in this country, with what's happening pleasure. about the regulations. I mean, because you were talking about regulations. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jihad. Yeah, it was a great pleasure to, to and, have and been And thank you for, for the insights and for the honesty. No it was Jihad Salemi, Phoenician Funds. You.